Good morning. What a good day it is, and we've already met visitors this morning. Some of you have already, I already saw you talking to some of them. I met three or four over on this side before worship, and what a blessing that is to see visitors present this morning. If you don't know, today is Focus Sunday, which means there's going to be a meal afterward, which means that we would like to sit down with you. We want to sit down and get to know you better. We want to sit down and talk to our members and connect with people. We even sit down and we eat lunch with people from Texas. So if you are visiting or whatever it is, then we want to get to know you better and use that opportunity. That's a great opportunity uh, after services to connect with other people in the body of Christ. Well, Paul associated being a Christian with being a soldier, and so will Lane and I this month. Spiritual warfare is not just carrying a Bible. It's not preaching out of selfishness. It's not preaching with selfish motives. It's not preaching just to have some sort of an experience. It's not just being a Christian because you can say you're a Christian. The highest and most powerful aim for the Christian is walking according to God's word and following his will. That's the highest aim for the child of God. It's grabbing a hold of those who share with you that like precious faith and helping each other get to heaven. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 2 for a minute. We're going to be talking about comrades, and Paul blends soldiers and Christians in 2 Timothy 2. And he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Listen to this now right here. Since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Isn't that our aim? Our aim or our purpose is to please the one who enlisted us. And listen to the soldier talk in this text. Look at chapter 2 here, 2 Timothy 2. Look at verse 3. He talks about a soldier. Look at verse 9. He even goes further, and he keeps bringing across this soldier mentality, this metaphor. Verse 9, bound in chains. Verse 12, dying with Christ. Verse 14, Charge them before God. Verse 20, it's what's honorable and what's dishonorable. Does that remind you of anything? It reminds us of soldiers. Paul associated being a Christian with a soldier. And, and we're going to look at one of the reasons why. He didn't see Christianity as um, a man who would say, you know, hey, your soul, take ease. You've got everything you need. You've got enough stored up. Take ease. You're going to be okay for a while. He didn't see as a man who's going to sleep away life and just be like, hey, we've got it easy in this life. He didn't see it as, as a, a disassociation or uh, from, from feeding the hungry or helping the thirst, uh, those thirsty or those needing clothing in Matthew 25. He didn't uh, see that. He saw it as a soldier. He saw the Christian as a warrior. And I know you're probably thinking this morning, I don't feel like a warrior. Listen, there's times in our lives we don't. But being a Christian is not soft. It's not complacent. It's not apathetic. It's not half-hearted. Being a soldier of Christ is being a warrior. And we've got to walk the walk of faith, and we've got to stand next to our brothers <clears throat> in confidence. So let's ask this question. Why a soldier? Well, there's a lot of military metaphors that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 and other places. Lane and I are going to be covering this month. Uh, this is, for instance, these are three different reasons I listed here. You had military connections, knowledge of the Roman army, including the converts. The metaphor would have easily been understood during this time of writing. But, but here's really, if somebody say, well, why a soldier? <clears throat> a soldier stands in sacrificial steadfastness. A soldier understands risk. 
A soldier understands the enlistment. A soldier understands the service, and not only that, but the service that also could lead to even death. To die for someone else, even. To risk his life for. That's why he uses a soldier. So I want to ask you this question, is that us? If that's a soldier, is that us? Do we share that? I was asking myself this morning, man, I want to see this even more. I want to do this even more. I did a, I did a lot of reading about soldiers this week. And, you know, I wasn't in the military, but I, I opened up a lot of different books about different stories. And I don't, I don't want to go back and, and retell some of these. They might bring back horrific memories of someone. But I'm talking about the shell shock. I'm talking about the PTSD. I'm talking about... The, the things that soldiers went through that were so horrible, we can barely even fathom or grasp what they had to go through. There may be some individuals this morning here who've been a soldier, and you know. One specific story was about a soldier who had a, a very close friend right next to him, and they had fought together. They, they chatted so much together. They're just there, and they're, and they're fighting, and they're hurting, or, they're, or whatever their needs, and a grenade lands next to his friend. And he said he saw the friend look over at him with complete fear in his eyes. And he said the grenade didn't go off. He said, but it might as well have. He said that was enough to send that young man transported back. But he said, you know what got him better? When we could all meet, when we could all meet back together, he said, and that's what helped him get better. A soldier of Christ sees his comrades suffering. A soldier of Christ has in it his life work to reach lost souls. A soldier of Christ remembers signing on that dotted line the confession, the good confession of his faith. The confession is his life. He signed on that. A soldier of, of Christ wages war against the devil and his schemes. A soldier of Christ has a deep longing to be in worship service. A soldier of Christ bears fruit. And lastly, a soldier of Christ doesn't fight alone. Have you ever been scared to do something and then if somebody else goes with you, everything's fine? I'm one of those guys, I hate to tell you that, but there's some things, sometimes I'm like, honey, I don't think I can, and she said, I'll go with you. I said, okay, we're gonna do it, I got it, let's do it. And so I remember in Israel last year, we're in Israel and, and she really badly wants to go through Hezekiah's tunnel. And uh, so Hezekiah's tunnel, if you don't know, back in Hez it's all the way back to Hezekiah's time and when he, when he was a king of Judah, dates all the way back to then. It's a tunnel that's 583 yards, imagine that. And it's deep, and it's dark, and it's wet, and it's small, and I don't like spaces like that. And she wants to do this. Well, we, we get over there closer to it, and here it is. And, and we get down there, and Gail and, and Dale were there, and, and I said, I, I don't know if this is for me. And I really started to back off. And Gail, I saw the look in her eyes. She was thinking the same thing. She was like, I, I don't know. And we look up, and summer's gone. And I had a moment there where I was like, what kind of a husband are you going to be? I don't want to be the guy meeting her 583 yards on the other side. Honey, how did it go? So we went through there, and it was like something about having somebody right there next to you. It's like God knew, didn't he? It's because he did know. Comrades give us more bravery. They give us more accountability. They give us more support. You got Paul and Silas. You got Mary and Martha. You got Zachariah and Elizabeth. You got Ruth and Naomi. You got David and Jonathan. We could go on and on and on and on. There are messages and messages about having comrades in this war. So I want to say this this morning as a first point to a second point here. Here are your comrades right here. And as, as simple as that is, believe it or not, we forget that. Here are your comrades in the spiritual war that we are in right now. 
So then you're no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We don't seek victory by ourselves. I, I, we, we sometimes forget that and we think, well, I'm going to do this. Here's the church over here. This is what we do. We don't seek victory by ourselves. We can't. And I, I'm reminded of Exodus um, 17 where Moses, remember, he's holding up his hands or his arms. And there's members out here in the audience right now. You're holding up your arms and we get weak and we forget sometimes there's an Aaron and there's a her right next to us. And when they hold up our arms together and we get weak, there's victory there with the Lord. But when we think we've got it all done by ourselves and we think we can, you know, sometimes I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to be honest. Sometimes we say, you hear somebody say these words. I, I planned that. Okay. I baptized so-and-so. Okay. Is that what it's about? Nope. You see, when we hold up our hands like this and we think it's all us, guess what? We get weak. And when we get weak, guess what you need? You need the body of Christ. John the Baptist was amazing. But who is he without Elizabeth and Zechariah? Timothy may have been this great evangelist, but what about Lois and Eunice? Paul trained at the feet of Gamaliel, but he understood the power of his comrades here in this text. So he made every opportunity to bring someone from a connection to a comrade. He sat in prison for years in Caesarea and, and Rome, and, and he established connections with people and brought them to the Lord, his comrades. And I think of Hebrews 10, 25, don't neglect meeting together as some of you have, but he said, encourage one another. Encourage one another. So much more as you see the day approaching. I checked the Durant Facebook recently where our members post prayer needs. And a while back for like three days during the day, it was a post on that page every hour. That's your comrades. Pain, illness, loss, hurt, every hour. But this congregation is like the command center of encouragement and prayers. This is your team, this is your comrades, it's your companions, your, and the word means fellow workers. This is who you are. Um, these aren't the individuals, you know, I want to say, these aren't the individuals scanning your groceries. These aren't the individuals that are just out there selling you a car, okay? These are those that you share a like precious faith with. Jesus said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Boy, think about that passage. And what does that mean? That means your family, your kids, whoever, you know, the, the body of Christ, your family ought to be so eager to be around these people. Let me say that again. Some of you are kind of dazed and tired from the game yesterday. Listen, I'm say this again. This is your family. Your family ought to be, we ought to be so eager to be around these people. Numerous times I get asked by other people in other congregations about the ministry team here. And they say, well, we want to, we want to, and I don't know, maybe three or four times a church will call. We've had one minister and we're moving, kind of transitioning. We want to have a ministry team. And we see what's happening at the Durant Church of Christ. And I say, listen, if you want something at the Durant Church of Christ, you're going to have to go find another Lane and another Jared who understand that preaching the gospel is not about selfish motives. It's about reaching the hearts of people. And these two individuals, these two individuals are there where the people are and they care about the people. And I love Lane and I love Jared. So I, I'm like, well, I, I'm hoping you guys can establish that. But what we have here is an amazing blessing. And then somebody calls about our youth group. Another congregation in town calls about the youth group and says, hey, we'd like to have a youth group like that. How do you think we could get to that point? And I said, listen, these kids over here, 
they understand the value of being together. And they're not just a youth group, they are comrades. What a blessing, y'all. Turn to Romans 16 with me for a minute. Romans chapter 16. Here are Paul's comrades, okay? Yeah, I've got them listed up on the screen too. Um, and, and we would say, well, Paul, he just ascend, attended on Sundays, right? Not by this list, okay? Look at this list. He liked company. He sought out fellowship. He wanted to be around people. He sent letters. He included people in campaigns. He, de he depended on these individuals. Look at this. Look at Paul associating Christianity here. Phoebe, a servant of the, of the church in Sincrea. Help her in whatever way you can. She has been a patron, a patron of many and myself as well. He's saying, welcome her. Our sister, he says. That means his sister in Christ. She wasn't just a sister in Christ, though. She was an active, useful part of the church. Look at that. Look at Priscilla and Aquila. And by the way, there had to be some humorous jokes about their rhyming names, right? Okay, anyway, that's another topic. But they risked their life for Paul. We look around here and you're like, I don't know if I would risk my life for that person. Would you? I believe we need to be there. But look at all these. There, there's so many. That's just, that's just three names. Um, their toil, their service, their love for the church, their sacrifice. There's something happens when you gather together in your home. Look, at, they, they brought people into their home. You won't believe what happens with relationship when you take somebody and you say, come over to my house. Let me be hospi hospitable towards you. Let us share over the, over the table. Adronicus and, and Hunya, kinsmen of fellow prisoners, probably a husband and a wife. These are people he shared with. Jews, Gentiles, slaves who become free. He lists all these names out there and says, this is my comrades. These are my comrades. He plants. Apollos waters. God gives the increase. Who in this room would be included in your list? Who would you insert? You're sending out a letter to greet someone. Who would you insert? Greet sister so-and-so, greet sister so-and-so, or brother so-and-so. And Jesus is saying, this is your family. We went over that passage in Matthew 12. Well, what comrades do you have in this war, in this room? Why all this? because we are in an all-and-out spiritual war with the forces of darkness. I talk to parents quite a bit, and I want to focus on parents and kids just for a second, if you have kids at home. Parents, we are, we are locking our doors at night, but TikTok and Snapchat is still in the house. And someone might say, well, that's not really harmful. It's just a kid thing. It is not a kid thing, brothers and sisters. If you knew how many parents have come to ministers struggling with those two apps and something major that happened with those two, you'd understand why we talk about that. We lock our doors, but the devil's still inside. We have to be actively aware. Um, so I want to encourage you, list off your comrades, list off, this is a big one, list off your kids' comrades here at the church. Your, com your kids have comrades here? It hurts my heart to hear of parents who later beg for their children to return to God. I, I don't want that to happen to me or anybody. And often myself, I have found myself being accommodating to my children rather than equipping them. You understand the difference? In 2 Kings, I can't move forward without this text. The Arameans were at war with Israel, and here is Aram, and he's 
counts him down on Elisha, and Elisha had messed up all of his schemes and all of his plans, and he, he sends his whole army to capture Elisha, and they've surrounded the city and, and surrounded it, and his, and his servant gets up in the morning and he says, uh, alas, which alas in Hebrew means to me, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> I don't know what it is in Hebrew, but alas, he's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, Elisha? And you know the statement that Elisha makes? He says, don't be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. In other words, Lord, open our eyes so that we can see you working in all that we do. I read a story of an escaped prisoner who wandered days and nights seeking the Union lines. Early morning dusk, he comes into the camp, which he thought was his enemy, and before anything, he's surrounded by pickets and captured to be hurried back to the prison, as he thought. But to his surprise and his joy, he found it was his own soldiers. He'd been captured by his friends. I challenge all of you this morning as we come to a close, look around you. These are your comrades. These are the ones you're supposed to share life with. Lift up your eyes. Look at this. Elijah, Elisha and his servant needed reassurance that God was there. And then Elisha prays and says, Oh, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. A lot of times, and that's what they were doing, they're looking for reassurance. And someone came a few weeks ago and they were talking and they were like, I just need, Logan, I need some reassurance. I want to challenge you this morning, one of the major points of the lesson, look around. This right here is your reassurance that God is working, that we're all together worshiping him. We all have struggles. We all have our mistakes, but we're still together bound by that like precious faith. One man wrote about that text in 2 Kings. Turn to the Bible and get into the company of those men and those women whose might is in other weapons and who are covered with the panoply of God and who see the army of God with them. I brought something to show you. Last year, the elders made a decision, a good decision, decided that it's probably at a certain time it's not good to meet such a large group. Remember that? So we all kind of went to our homes for, I don't know, a couple months? I don't even remember how long it was. And I remember thinking to myself, what now? Maybe it's possible we could have a few people in our home. Some of you did the same thing. Smaller group, a little safer. Having somebody tell us that you couldn't meet with your brothers and sisters in Christ was unbearable. Some of you did anyway. I know Lane did too, so it's okay. Some of you did anyway. Some of you met in your home. Some of you gathered up some people, just whatever you could do, and, you, and, and there's something about gathering together. And, and I made this little Lord's Supper tray. And a while afterwards, I was thinking, you know, in summer, I believe it was said, we need to keep that as a reminder, you know what the diff, you, you know what it reminds me of is there are there are some people who go to church and there are some people who need the church, who long for the church, who long to be beside their brothers and sisters in Christ. That means if somebody said you can't meet today because of whatever reason, that means you long to be together. There are brothers and sisters here this morning that this is what they have. And they're struggling with all different things in their life. And they come here and they, they, they shake a hand. And if you're deciding, hey, I don't know, should I go and encourage people? There are some people here, this is all they have. Do you go to church, brothers and sisters, or do you need the church? Maybe there's someone here this morning who's struggling as a soldier of Christ, struggling to see the need to be beside our comrades, struggling to, because of the sin in their life, or maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you need to become one this morning as we stand and sing.